the Frontline Club. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, in a moment, I'll hand you over to uh, Michael Goldfarb, who is going to chair this evening's event. Uh, Michael is a journalist and author, and he's just completed a um, programme for BBC Radio 4. Go out at, on Monday night at 8pm on, on Donald Trump, so do look out for that. Um, but before I hand over to him, if I can just ask you to quickly turn your phones to silent, and when it comes to questions, if you can wait for the microphone that I'll be bringing around... Um, because we are broadcasting this evening's event live on our YouTube channel. So over to Michael. Thank, th thank you very much, uh, Millicent, thanks. Um, can you hear me, first of all, more or less? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, this evening's panel is as advertised. Um, normally what happens at these things is the panel gets introduced and then a softball question is sent around 90 seconds, 90 seconds, 90 seconds, and then we sort of try and warm things up. I think that this astounding presidential campaign, which is only just coming to the end of the first act, I mean, it, we, we have 10 days to go until the Iowa caucuses, and, and really, I mean, that's when, when things start, has already flabbergasted the world, it's flabbergasted experts, it has everybody posting, so I'm not going to do that tonight. I'm going to introduce the panel lob a question into the shark pool, and then we'll be away. And after about 45 minutes, we'll invite you to, to ask your questions, join in, make your comments, okay? So here we go. Um, the panel is, is very good. It's very top table kind of, high table kind of panel. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be polite, not sexist, and introduce Zenia Wicket first. She's the head of the U.S. program at Chatham House and the Dean of the Academy for Leadership in International Affairs there. Um, Adam Brooks, to her right, yes. Um, you will probably recognize him. They always look so different when they're not on television. Adam spent many, many years a, as a BBC correspondent in Washington. He's covered m what, all, of the, uh, all of the elections since 2004, so that's three on the trot. Um, a period of unexpected change, but we didn't quite understand just how much change, I think, until this election season. Um, seated at the far end is Peter Trubowitz, who's Professor of International Relations at the LSE, and before that, Peter was a Professor of Law at the University of Texas, and that's a transition. Not law, but political science. Political but science. It's close. <laughs> oh, I, I've often wondered, why is it, why are they different? I mean, surely law and politics should we be very closely time. related, <laughs> <laughs> except maybe, you know, no, no backhanders here. Um, anyway, it's an interesting leap from Austin to London, and he seems to have survived, so that's good. And immediately to my left, even though he's actually on the panel's right, is <laughs> William Lowry, who works um, as the vice chair of Republicans overseas mm -hmm. here in the United Kingdom. So that's the panel, and I think that the, the question that's on my mind, I've just come back from America, I was in South Carolina and in New York City, and the, the question I, I have to ask is, hand on heart, a year ago, if, had you any idea that this is where we would be in the presidential campaign of 2016, with Donald Trump well ahead of the pack of the Republican Party, and with Bernie Sanders gaining traction on Hillary Clinton. And I open it up. Who wants to speak first? Come on, don't be polite. Okay. Zenia, go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> Sucker for punishments. Uh, no, I mean, perhaps we should have been. I mean, I think it's interesting to think about the fact that, you know, in polling terms, we've been doing pretty badly. I mean, you know, take, take what's been going on in the United Kingdom over the last few months. You know, who would have anticipated the current Labour leader? Had you asked that question, polling didn't suggest it. The polling for the for the um, the British election is that now a year ago, coming up to it. Um, we didn't get that right. If you'd asked us a year ago about you know we'd be here in the United States, I don't think anybody would, in good conscience, have said yes. We didn't anticipate that Trump would have as much traction as he had. We certainly didn't anticipate that Bernie Sanders would be doing quite as well as he's doing in the primaries, in the initial primaries, so we're talking here about Iowa and New Hampshire, he's doing very well. Whether he would do well in, the, in them and in the subsequent primaries, we don't know. So, no, I don't think we thought it was going to be this close. Um, should we have? Possibly, there's okay, a different that, moment. That's a there's good a question, Peter. Should we have? 
Uh, maybe, because uh, the thing that surprised me the most about this um, is really the depth of white resentment in the United States. I think that's the most revealing thing, shocking thing, and it's on both sides. So on the Trump side, on the Republican side, what you've got are really Reagan Democrats, blue collar, some of them actually, uh, you know, recent Democrats from like the Appalachians that are very pro-Trump. And interestingly enough, he's actually tapping now blue collar evangelicals. On the left, with Sanders, you really also have a kind of white phenomena because it's a different cohort, if you will, of white voters, college age, highly educated, and they're turned off by Hillary, and they're turned on by Sanders or at least some alternative to to Hillary, they want something that is more progressive than what the Clintons have to offer. And so uh, to me, that is the most, one of the most striking things about this cycle. Adam, you actually live in the US. We're all London-based. How surprised are you? And when did you become really surprised? When did you realize it was a Well, I mean, you know, if you think back to 2012, we had that extraordinary moment in the primaries. Do you remember when we cycled through every single Republican candidate. First Herman Cain led, and then, and, uh, and then um, Michelle Bachman led, and, and everybody had that little moment in the sun. Uh, when Trump announced uh, and his numbers started really ticking up, I thought, and I think a lot of us thought, okay, we're gonna see the same phenomenon again. We're gonna cycle through all these candidates, and Rubio's gonna have his moment, and Cruz will have his moment, and, the, and it didn't happen. And, and, and Trump just sort of stayed have, and stayed and stayed. You know, uh, uh, for the most part, Trump has dominated, you know, pretty much since the fall, right? I mean, there was, yes, there were little iterations. Well, I mean, of you that, had, but, um, but I never, I certainly never Carson envisaged that Trump was going Carson to. Carson had a very brief moment. And yeah. Fiorina Both had their brief Fiorina moment did, in the sun. Ever, no, Fiorina, Fiorina made, made the best out of being in, in the small, in, in the little kids group in that first <laughs> debate. <laughs> and she did so well that she had a brief moment and then yeah. it yeah. faded very yeah. quickly. Trump. Um, this is the question you always get as the de facto Republican on a panel, so I really should be prepared for it right now. Um, I think people are very angry. They are very angry, uh, both on the right and on the left, um, because they believe the political system isn't working. Um, and I think, you know, you just mentioned that we had this brief moment in 2012 where we uh, flirted with the idea of nominating Herman Cain in his famous 999 plan. He was trying to sell you pizzas. And I think people sort of gave up and they said, well, we'll give it one more go uh, with, with Mitt Romney and the establishment. And that didn't work. It didn't win the election. And I think people, particularly on the right, just feel like the entire country has left them behind and they're out of control. And I, I don't think it is white resentment. Um, I think it's a matter of issues. And, and I think it's, very, it's much more complicated than just race. Race is certainly a part oh. of it. but. It's, it's economics, it's regions, it's everything. And I think on right and left, people are <coughs> very convinced that another Clinton isn't going to make things work and that an establishment choice isn't going to make things can, work. Peter, can come, I, on, can I, come on yeah, back on that. So uh, by white resentment, I don't mean, uh, I, I, I wasn't really trying to uh, evoke kind of uh, uh, the racial dimension of American politics. I mean, in some ways, none of this should be surprising to us. Unemployment has gone down in the United States. I mean, actually, on Obama's watch, the growth in employment, I mean, it's been really quite strong, you know, especially recently. But if you look at wages in the United mm -hmm. States, it's flat. And so it's the resentment about what's happening to people economically. Yeah, people feel like they're getting screwed, especially it, what's interestingly, interesting about it on the Republican side. Yeah, absolutely. But on, I think kind of progressive white Democrats think that there is something fundamentally wrong also, that there's too much inequality, there's not enough attention being paid to the environment and so forth. And, and it, it's, it's what's interesting about it to me is that it is really coming from white constituencies. They're the ones that are really speaking up. But, but can, I, can I just pick up on right. that very, very quickly? Uh, if you want to look at how um, uh, whites, uh, that, that the sources of, of, of what you might call white anger, white resentment. Some research just came out from Princeton a couple of weeks ago, uh, a couple of months ago. I don't know if you've seen this. Um, uh, they have discovered that mortality rates 
among non-college educated whites in the United States have spiked in a way that is truly alarming. Um, it's being compared to death rates uh, when the AIDS epidemic was at its height. Uh, it's being compared to death rates among uh, men in uh, Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, if you are white, non-college educated in the US, your death rates have gone up by 20% since 1999. About half a million people have died prematurely. This is between the ages of 45 and 54. Now, the, the real kicker here is that Princeton found that these death rates are not from diseases of poverty. They're not from um, diabetes, heart disease, and lung cancer. It's from suicide, alcohol poisoning, and drug overdoses, particularly from cheap opioids, from OxyContin. Uh, and and, 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 and th th this is an, an extraordinary statistic, which is flawed both yeah. the Democratic and Republican establishment. I, I just want to add in, Adam, you can carry on with the point, is that yesterday in the Times of the same socioeconomic group, but kids, um, 18 to whatever, 25, their death rates have skyrocketed as well, and for the same causes, suicide, drug overdose, form of suicide, and so on. So anyway, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but it, no. it's across the board so within where, where this particular So where every other group. demographic, uh, death rates continue to fall for that age group, this one demographic of poor, mostly rural white people uh, 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 is spiking. And it's a measure of just how far poor rural white people have been left behind, have been screwed over the last 20 years. But the, interestingly, Christie has really spoken to this and gotten traction mm -hmm. in, uh, there's some fantastic video clips of, of him addressing audiences in New Hampshire on precisely very personal stories about people that he knows that have been left behind, killed themselves and so forth. It's, it is, it, it's, he's really, I mean, he's tapped something. I'm not saying. So is Cruz. So Cruz yes. has also, over the last few yeah. days, in fact, yeah. tapped the whole drug taking, right. you know, issues in his family of drug taking, etc. I mean, everybody is now tapping mm -hmm. this section of society because they're recognizing, of course, that's a vote winner. Um, maybe. But maybe. William. Maybe. Mm -hmm. if, Ex they vote. If, they, if they vote. Explain. A lot of these, these guys, a lot of these Trump supporters won't actually vote. How, however, however oh, everybody, everybody, say everybody say says that. <laughs> but we'll, we'll that. see because we haven't had voters. But I'd like to ask William. Why he thinks we, we have a picture of, you know, in, in, we're, in, we're here in Britain, we're, mm -hmm. we're very class conscious. And if you think, well, if you tell me that in Middlesbrough, where the last steel factory just closed, and they've already had 35 years of very harsh, very uncared for deindustrialization, mm -hmm. if you say, well, uh, life expectancy on T side is down, um, people here would probably understand what we're talking about. But why, if life expectancy is down, not just in West Virginia, because they, they, they've been voting Republican for a long time on the gun issue, well, only the last but why, why years, yeah. then would a billionaire, mm -hmm. loudmouth from New York, be the person on whom they are pinning their hopes? You know, there's a as a Republican, what's your what's your view? Well, I uh, personally, let me confess, I'm not a Trump supporter, and I think um, I'm probably not the person to explain why people support Trump if I'm not supporting him. So that. With that caveat, I do know Trump supporters. Um, and I have asked them this very <laughs> question. <laughs> As do we all, but, but yes, go ahead. And I, I've asked them, you know, I've, uh, I'll give an example. I know a very successful um, businessman, came from nothing, started his own business, does a wonderful job, employs 15 people in the Midwest. Um, and I asked him, and he was avidly for Trump. And I asked him, you know, this guy is not you. I mean, he came from wealth, he's entitled. Uh, you can argue he didn't do anything better than what he would have done had he just invested the money in a fund. Um, I mean, so, you know, why are you, why are you, why are you supporting this man? And he said, because he's the only person who's not in it for himself in the sense that He's independent. He's not. No, 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 no. I mean, look. I think Donald Trump is all about Donald Trump. I don't believe yeah, forget that. Forget his ego. Okay, but the perception. <laughs> but the perception. The perception is that he can't be bought. 
He's going to say what he says. He's going to do what he does. And he's effective. And those are four things you don't get from any Washington, D.C. politician right now. Right. And people are sick and tired, and they're willing to give anybody, literally anybody, who can promise them that they will build a wall and make Mexico pay for it, which might be the most ridiculous claim you've ever heard. But people <laughs> really believe he's actually going to do that, because why would you doubt him? Anybody want to jump in on that? <laughs> anybody have insights into this? As I say, I mean, I, I was speaking with couple of very well-off retirees in a very, very nice place south of Charleston who are lifelong Republicans, and they're all in for Donald Trump. And I, I said, he's a Yankee. What, are you kidding me? And they're very Southern guys. And they said, it doesn't matter. He's not one of them. The appeal seems mm -hmm. to be that he, he can legitimately put himself forth <coughs> as not being a professional politician. Mm -hmm. But this, I mean, this is, uh, this is not unique to the United States. I mean, populists are becoming stronger everywhere. Populists are becoming stronger here. They're becoming st stronger in France, in all, all sorts of countries in Europe. You're, you're finding that the, that the populist vote is, is strengthening. The same thing is happening in the United States. It's, you know, the, the anything but what we're used to vote. Now, the question is, is, is um, was mentioned earlier, are these people actually going to come out and vote when the time comes? I mean, Pew just brought out some results that I saw today that, that showed in December 20, 2007, 74% uh, of Republicans, I'm just going to give you the Republican numbers, 74% of the Republican numbers gave a lot of thought to the candidates. Today, that's 86%. I mean, that's a significant rise. Now, if, he, if Trump Presumably, that is is in large part Trump supporters. If they can actually come out, then Trump's actually got a pretty good chance of doing really rather well. It's a huge if. Adam, I think Trump is where he is, uh, at least in part because the Republican establishment has not settled on a candidate, and the vote is split. The Republican establishment vote is split between Kasich. Rubio, Cruz, and Christie. Mm -hmm. If uh, the Republican establishment can settle on one of those guys, and that... And Bush. And Bush, I'm sorry. Uh, forgot, I forgot about Bush. Um, it's happening a lot to him recently. <laughs> when they, when, the, when, when... explains when, the 3%. Yeah, yeah <laughs> right. <laughs> when these guys finally coalesce, I mean, if it happens, and there emerges uh, an establishment candidate, uh, then we might see a completely different dynamic in the race. We might see um, Trump running at about, whatever he's at, 25%, and, and Cruz running at about the same, and an establishment candidate theoretically running at about the same. But it kind of depends if these other guys stay in the race or if people start dropping out. I think that's crucial now. William, just jump yeah, in. Yeah. So I think there's, there's, it's, it's important to understand that the primary in the media is not actually how we choose um, the nominee for the President of the United States. So there's a long, long process with a lot of delegates that you need to win. And the process is structured so that, um, quite frankly, the odds are in favor of the establishment candidate. Um, the the all-delegate states, you know, the states where you win the state, you get all the delegates for that state, that doesn't happen until much, much later in the process, after the, the establishment the vote can, you know, fall away. Mm. Um, so it's, it's, it's very foreseeable that you know, could, Trump could take Iowa, he could take New Hampshire, he could take South Carolina, say Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio get Nevada, and there's still a path to the nomination for an establishment candidate, and all your other contenders for the establishment have dropped out. That's Peter? true, but by the time you get past, you get past Super Tuesday, 50% of the delegates on the Republican side will have been chosen. So I think if you imagine that I mean, if, if Trump, I think the big test is the Iowa caucus. I mean, you know, it takes some work to go to the caucus and actually cast your ballot there and so forth, and a lot of these Trump supporters have not voted or are not regular voters and so forth. If they show up there, I would say that means something serious mm -hmm. is happening in the United States. And, 
And if he wins there and he wins New Hampshire, he's got momentum, he's leading in South Carolina. I mean, you know, the, I think the media does count. I mean, that suddenly it's like they'll amplify all that. It'll become a very big story. It could be like a, a well, this, 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 there has been, this has been going on. It's hard to see Trump more amplified than he is. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I mean, I mean he's already I, I, huge. I, I, but, right? but the, the point, the, the, that's been since the beginning of this surge forward by Trump, which I'll, I'll wager that most of us here probably find almost inexplicable mm -hmm. um, that, you know, uh, people will turn to Nate Silver, who's everybody's guru, because he picks every race right, and he's got the numbers that show everything that the polling is showing in favor of Trump now, when it's you know put in its perspective against all the other stuff that has to happen, just speaking numerically, says mm -hmm. Nate, he's got maybe 8% of the vote in America, he's getting 90% of the coverage, this is insane. This is basically the Nate Silver viewpoint, and I can tell you that on my Facebook news feed, it's the general new view. But I do wonder if at this point there's something really new afoot. And I'd like to put this to all of you. We've spoken over the last 15 minutes as people speak in the media about this. We refer to our polls. Mm -hmm. We refer to the history. Um, the, the New York Times, I mean, uh, David Leonhardt, who runs the Upshot crew in Washington, they shut down regional bureaus because they were expensive and have eliminated regional reporting at the New York Times and instead put money into the upshot in Washington and they do a lot of cephologizing. They're very smart guys, they look at the numbers, they write intelligent essays about the numbers. And I do wonder if perhaps we in the media have gone a little bit too far into the comfort zone of, well this poll says, and actually if you look back in 2012, at this, if you see these numbers, on coming out of Iowa, it means X, as if there's not some reality that has happened. I mean, Peter brought up the um, unemployment rate. Yes, well, it's 5%. But we also know that it's the lowest labor force participation since 1979, which is when they started calculating that particular statistic. We don't know how long people who've been long-term unemployed go back into the labor market at what rate they're being paid. The reason we don't know that is that they laid off at the Bureau of Labor Statistics the unit that calculated what, what people's re-entry wages were, mm -hmm. which seems to me kind of a, a, a good way to understand whether people feel good about <coughs> them, an unemployment rate of 5% or think it's bullshit. So excuse my language. But my, I, my point is, have we missed something? Is there something that isn't measurable that's happening in America right now that isn't as obvious as it was in the 1960s, where, yes, there was something happening here. And what it was was exactly clear. People were against the war. People demanded racial justice 100 years after the Civil War ended. It's not so clear now. I, I, and what's real I, underneath all this? I mean, this is anecdotal. And I think when you get to real stories, they have to be. Um, statistics, statistics are useful friends, but they don't tell you the real story, as you just indicated. I, I'm in a bit of an interesting situation. So I'm 13 years older than my youngest sister. Uh, so we sort of were raised in different generations. And uh, you know, uh, confession, I'm a lawyer. Uh, and to become a lawyer in the States, lots of time, lots of energy, lots of investment. And I had no doubt when I was entering law school that all of that was worth it. Like I had just had no doubt I would go to law school, I would get a good job, the investment would be worth it, I would go forward. I doubt that now. I doubt, I doubt whether that seven years was really worth it. Right? Am I going to really make the income necessary to justify that? Will all this hard work really be for anything? Will I leave my family anything at the end of the day? That's, I mean, that's just how I feel. My sister, really bright, intelligent young girl, 10 years ago would have gone to a four-year school right away. Just no-brainer. Liberal arts education, gone into the workforce. Going to community college now. Why? It's not worth the investment to go to a four-year school. It just doesn't seem smart. So this is, this is the radical transformation that's happening in America. And, and maybe just to lead on from that, when you, when you think about those poor you know, rural white people that uh, uh, we were talking about before, and you think about this, people often refer to you know, the, the collapse of the American dream, the, 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 this notion that if you, if you live right and work by the rules, then your kids will do slightly better than you, and their kids will do slightly better than you. Think of being a middle-aged white guy, semi-skilled or, or skilled worker in America today, your father and your grandfather were the men who built American modernity. 
These are the guys who built the interstates. They built the skyscrapers. They were in the steel mills. They were in the shipyards. They were the NCOs in the military. You, know, you had enormous social status as a skilled, working-class white male through the 20th century. You were the big guy in the tool belt, right? I mean, uh, the cops, the firefighters. Yeah. All of that, not all of it, but a lot of it has gone. It's disappeared. The shipyards have gone. The steel mills have gone. The social status has gone. And if you're my age now as a semi-skilled white dude with no college education, you are coming, you're seeing the arc of your life and you're starting to realize that you are never going to th have the things your father had or your grandfather had. You're not going to have a secure pension. You're not going to have uh, um, better things for your kids. And you are never going to have the social status or the cachet that your father had. 50, 60 years ago. And I think, my sense, and again, it's purely anecdotal, but my sense is that for many, for many white men and their families, this is kind of psychologically devastating. Mm. I think it's a very, very important thing to, to look at. Can, can I put I, it? No, I, Zenia. I just because I, yes. Yes to all of those things. I mean, and again, it's anecdotal, but actually we have a lot of statistics, whether we want to believe them or not. We've got a lot of statistics yeah. that support this. But let me kind of pose two questions out there. The first question is, how different is this from 40 years ago or thereabouts when we went from manufacturing to services? So in some respects, we, we, we've been through huge transitions before, and we've come out the other side. So is this actually just another huge transition? And we have a tendency, humankind has a tendency, to take what we're going through now as being the biggest, the most dangerous, the most concerning, the most something. We don't tend to look at it with some kind of rational, actually, it was the Cold War. And that was, that was pretty dangerous, too. Um, so I, I, I hear everything you say, but I, I do have to ask myself the question of saying, you know, how different is this from something we went before? The other, the other question I just, I just want is, what are the implications? We're talking about politics here. What are the implications for politics? Or are the well, implications? Just, these or, are the or sources are the of Trump support. I mean, if you're looking for mm -hmm. who these guys are I, who well, are going to the rallies, I, I'm, I'm just going to Let me just say one of the sense people. Like or that. are they about people. policies? So is this politics or is this policies? Is I, it I, that, that actually? Sanya, I have to say, just to answer your question, um, I just think that that's far too, so too sophisticated a way of looking at it. Quite possibly. We, pretty clearly, these are deeply <coughs> emotional times. I just want to throw out that it, it's happening now, and we're surprised. But you know, is, is this just the spread of so the of what motiv motivated Occupy, but into the general population? Yeah. So Peter? I think that I, I mean I think Adam's description is like dead on, and uh, but I think. This is a secular trend. It didn't just happen. And what's and and it's for that reason that we shouldn't be surprised, but we are surprised. And it I think, you know, what Trump did, what Trump brought to the table, really, was he spoke to it. And in some ways, like in really negative ways, in in ways that are damaging to the United States, to its image abroad, but also internally. But he, you know, it takes people to speak to it, to capture it. And, you know, Hillary has been pulled to the left by this as well, by Sanders, who's also speaking to it. You know, I, we were talking before, and, you know, the thing about the Trump campaign, when I, I look back, the campaign it reminds me of the most is Ronald Reagan's run in the 1970s. And the thing is, is everybody dismissed Reagan as a buffoon, kind of like an early Berlusconi, you know, back then. Nobody believed that he could get traction. And I, I mean, I remember it very well. If you go back and you look at media reports and so forth, and the thing is, is he tapped an anger at that moment as well. Remember, it was a time when things were really tough in the U.S. Interest rates were through the roof. Unemployment was terrible. I mean, this was the Carter recession and everything. And, uh, you know, there's a somehow, like somebody, he's just, he's the first one, at least on the right, it seems to me, to speak to it. You have Sanders on the left. There's nobody else really on the Republican side before Trump who spoke to it. Three, three quick nobody. points. One, I think it's all summarized by Trump's campaign promise. Make America great again. I mean. Well, that's Ronald Reagan's campaign. Basically, right? yeah, yeah. And took. secondly, that was 40 years ago. I mean. I wasn't around then. That long ago. But, <laughs> but you know, 
third, regardless of whether it's rational or rational, th the fact is it exists, right? It's really motivating people to do what I would really consider to be an irrational thing. Literally, we're considering as a Republican nominee for president someone who has no evidence of consistent conservative positions or policies <laughs> at all. <laughs> Which is also like, very smart, right? Don't touch their entitlements. Yeah. Don't touch Medicaid. Right. Don't, don't, don't touch policy at all, actually. Don't touch policy at all. But don't make that mistake of arguing for small. Sorry, carry on. No, no, no. Republican. Well, right. it's smart or terrifying. I, right. I don't, you know, I waver between the two. <laughs> um, has, has a deep history of offending pretty much everyone he's ever met at some point in time. And three, Omarosa <laughs> literally could be Secretary of State. Isn't that terrifying? Uh, you were obviously not an American apprentice, Crowd, or else that would have gone <laughs> so much better. <laughs> well, after last night, Sarah Palin, would, would, I could, can you see her eyeballing Sergey Lavrov over some important detail Apparently, she of was, he, he mentioned her as Secretary of Energy at some point. I'm not oh, right. quite sure. Well, she's I, quite energetic. She's from, uh, from Alaska. From Alaska. <laughs> she can see he, Russia. He, that's he, all he that really. He passed on the opportunity when he was asked, would she be his vice president? And he passed on that. Yeah, well, well, so, yeah, but that's presidential timber, you know. The, <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 diff the, the interesting difference, I mean, mm -hmm. since I actually was alive in those days, <laughs> is that one is that Ronald Reagan had been a governor, yeah. really. and yeah. actually, of a consequential you, state, it, it, he was effective it, from his point of view. I mean, he did ultimately squash down student revolt at Berkeley, which mm. is considerably what got him elected, um, and then you know. Yeah. Was he still being tarred with the brush of being a Goldwater Republican in 1976? And he was. And it only took a few years, and then he was president again. So times change. And it was very tough economic times in the mid-'70s. But this is, this is, again, slightly different. I mean, it's as if for all of the grievance, and I, I, again, I, I just throw this out there, for all of the grievance, why do you think it is that people look at Donald Trump, I mean, people who are supporting him now, mm -hmm. and yeah, they may not turn out to vote, and Nate Silver may be absolutely right, and three months from now, you know, we'll have John Kasich as the, no, he, we won't, but I mean, uh, Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio. I think it's entirely yeah. possible we won't be talking about Trump in six weeks from now. You think so? I think yeah. it's entirely possible. I think it is, That's that a is marker. still very much a, uh, Adam Brooks put, uh, put, an put outcome out that, is, that is a real I'll, I'll tell you what's right. I think he's uh, if, if, he, if he loses <laughs> Iowa, no way we're talking about Trump six weeks from now. He's built himself as a winner who's going to run the table. He never loses. He's completely right. effective. So what happens but, when but he starts? Leave the it. bubble will pop. But leave, just to leave that aside for a second and, and just say, I don't know how you guys see him, and I don't know how you all see him, but I'm sure we'll find out when, when we throw it open. But I mean, <laughs> here's the guy who says you're fired, and he's a clown, and he's, you know, Ronald Reagan, you may have despised his politics, and you, or Margaret Thatcher, you may have said, I can't bear to listen to that woman. But in the end, you know, there was a serious person behind all that. You know, Donald Trump somehow, I think, s speaks to a population, a society that has become so mediatized that they can't look at a box and, and, and see anymore the difference between an entertainer and a serious person. Anybody? I think I mean, that sounds like a bit of a Jeremiah to me, to be honest. Really? Yeah, you, you, it, 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 so what do you think people see when they see Donald Trump then, Adam? I think a certain slice of the Gary Johnson said a few weeks ago that, you know, all politicians know that in any electorate, there is a slice of that electorate, so between 10 and 20 percent, that reacts well to demagoguery. You know, Berlusconi knew it, Le Pen knows it, Farage knows it, lots of people know it. Most politicians choose not to go and demagogue them, because it doesn't work out well, usually. Uh, Trump has chosen to demagogue them. They're a small slice of the electorate. There's not very many of them. America is not being pulled to the right. I would argue exactly the opposite. It's moving left, and what we're seeing is fear and backlash against an underlying demographic shift towards a more progressive, uh, centrist leftist politics. The voice of Tacoma Park. Yes. <laughs> Zenia, and then we're going to move on to the other's team. Go ahead. Well, no, I mean, I just, I, I, I guess I react a little bit to your America's moving less the de left. The demographics are certainly moving left um, in the sense that actually you're getting, you know, I mean, everybody said four years ago that unless, and I think it's still true today, unless you can actually get the Hispanic vote, can you win the presidency of the United States? Now, the Hispanic vote at the moment leans Democrat. But that's in large part due to a policy, sorry to bring up the policy word again, immigration. 
If that were off the table, which, assuming the Republicans lose later this year, we will get through some immigration um, um, policy in the next in the next term, then actually the Hispanics are actually quite conservative. And again, I'm making huge generalizations here, but you know the idea that America's moving left isn't necessarily 100% accurate. And actually, if you look at at, at studies done on policies in the United States, actually there is a very significant faction, the Tea Party <coughs> faction, that is moving American policies rightward in many respects, which is in part why President Obama, for one reason or another, is, is doing things by executive order, because he can't, get, can't otherwise get things done. if you said to me in 2006 that we'll have a black man in the White House, gay marriage will be legal, marijuana will be legal in however many states it's now legal in, uh, uh, or will have gone some way down the road towards universal health care provision. I would have laughed at you. But we also yeah, have, here on, we are, you know. on the contrary, we also have people trying to push back very, very hard on abortion rights. We have made absolutely no progress on environmental issues. I, I wouldn't agree with that. Except well, by executive order. I mean, I think and there's a way to square the circle here a little bit. Um, I mean, I, I, my perception is that the United States is deeply, deeply polarized, and, yes. uh, and it partly goes a long ways to explaining the dysfunction that we see in, in the U.S., and so I wouldn't disagree that the needle, the policy needle, has moved to the left while Obama has been in office, but it's not difficult to imagine that some of this could get rolled back or that we could see movement towards towards the right, depending upon, you know, if 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 Hillary loses, Sanders doesn't defeat her, Hillary loses, and you, what, depending on what kind of Republican you get. But let, 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 now that you've provided the segue, let's talk a bit about Bernie Sanders. Um, when, when it first came up around, around the panel, who would, who would you make the analogy to in, in British politics? Because that question gets put a lot. How would you explain Bernie Sanders in the British terms? I wouldn't attempt it. I would yeah. put is it there in an analogy? Terms, but, uh, is there an analogy? Adam. <laughs> <laughs> don't look at me. No, I mean, well, I don't I think there is one. Oh, come on, analogy. you guys you guys have been talking so well amongst yourselves, and I thought for sure there, there'd be an idea. But then let's talk about Bernie Sanders and say, is he just, you know, an extreme bug that, that she needs to scratch, or does he have legs? Adam, and, and you live there, so I'm, I'm going to ask you again. Um, again, you know, if you'd said to me three, four months ago, I would have said, he's interesting because he's forcing the debate to the left. He doesn't have legs. I'm absolutely not sure that's the case anymore. I mean, again, without wanting to get too far into unreliable poll numbers, uh, his unreliable poll numbers are looking very good. <laughs> uh, but there is just a, there's a crackle in the air, you know. There's 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 a fizz in the air, and and the, the the kids, young people, for some reason, and I struggle to explain what it is, just um, just love the guy. Must they be socialism. Can, <laughs> it's not. I mean, a socialist. That's what he calls he's, himself. He calls it, he's, the, he's the only person in the, the last thirty years who to say right. he was a, he the electoral a equivalent Democrat. of sticking yourself Democrat. in the Social eye. Democrat. 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 I, I, I think, <laughs> and campaigning on the fact you got a fork in your eye. Yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> the, the kids, the kids, no the kids, sense the kids love that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the kids. The, uh, yeah. I guess. Yeah. I love this. I know. They like the Larry David impersonation. I think. I think. Two things. One. I can't think of someone who's more establishment than Hillary Clinton. Like, I mean, literally, she represents, as Ted Cruz likes to say, the Washington cartel or the evil empire or whatever it is. Or New York values. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, I'm from New York, for the record. Uh, so but, am I. <laughs> uh, she, she, she represents that. And I think the same dissatisfaction with the establishment on the right is also evident on the left. And it was crying out for a challenger. Elizabeth Warren was yep. their champion. She elected not to run, perhaps because she's a bit more behoven to the establishment than uh, she likes to think she is. Um, Bernie Sanders bears <laughs> there's no love for the establishment. He is his own man. He always has been. Um, and I think he just stepped. He was the, the, the right person to step into a, a part of the Democratic base, that's 40%. That's my analysis as someone who is not a Democrat at all. Does any of this go back to Occupy? I think so. So, but I, I mean, I think that's part of it. 
I mean, part of it is it, it, it stems from Clinton herself. So there's, there's only one other person in the race that has uh, negatives as high as Hillary Clinton. That happens to be Donald Trump. Um, very high negatives. Normally, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't ha get the kind of traction. This is why this is so amazing in, in many respects. That neither of these candidates would have the kind of traction politically that they do have, given the negatives. So I think part of it has to do with her, but I think part of it is is that the party has is ha the party has moved to the left, just like Republicans have moved to the right. The center has been hollowed out in the United States, the political center. And I think, I, and and Democrats, I think certainly around you know where I am in in in, in Washington, um, are just wondering what's the next shoe to drop with Hillary. You know, you just never yeah. know what's going to happen. Who, how can you make a Force 12, you know, gold-plated national scandal out of an email server? Right. right. That, well, the Clintons will find a way. Do you want me to expound? Hillary, <laughs> will, <laughs> Hillary will show you how that's done. No, but there's <laughs> and, 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 you know, there will be more. There will be other ones next month and the month after that, mm. and the Democrats are sick of it. But do you think, I mean, but here's the interesting thing in a split country. Um, now when I go to America <coughs> and engage people in conversation, whatever, I, somewhere in the middle, once we're friendly, I, I say, tell me, what's your media? What do you read in the morning? I usually talk to people old enough to still read the paper in the morning. And you would be amazed at how narrow the selection is. I mean, it's predictable, but you'd think that because there is no longer a an institution, not even the New York Times, that has the respect of the general population that they go, well, this is the general well where we get a certain amount of knowledge about the state of the world. And I think that that adds to the, to the split. I mean, there is no center because it, it does seem to be so dramatically split, except maybe in certain population centers like Washington, D.C., where people live and breathe politics and know about compromise, or what passes for compromise these days. Um, Senya? No, but I mean, it, uh, what we don't understand is why is there the polarization, which came first? I mean, there's an awful lot of studies that said, well, people became polarized, and then they decided to live in areas that had people that looked like them, and then, you know, then, then the polarization kind of happened that way. There's a lot of studies, gerrymandering, there's a lot of studies that suggest that, you know, if you look at the policy, you look in Congress, and you've seen complete polarization. So I think two years ago was the first year that the most conservative Democrat was still to the left of the most liberal Republican. Um, so, you know, had absolutely no overlap in Congress. And so, you know, you've got your chicken and egg syndrome, is, which came first. You know, and now, of course, we have two leaders, Trump and Sanders, whether you like them or not, who are tapping in to the more extreme sides of their parties, and they are pulling the parties even further to the extremities. What, you know, one of the interesting things from Obama's State of the Union, which was now, what, 10 days ago, he said, you know, generally speaking, presidents don't get up there and say, here's what I regret, here's what I didn't do well. Obama got up there and said, you know, the thing I regret the most is I had intended to bring the, bring the country together, and actually the country has become more polarized under my watch. Now, you can argue whether he's to blame for that or whether the Republicans started it, and again, we're back, we're back to our chicken and egg. But the question then becomes, you know, sorry to go here again, but after this is all done and dusted, Let's look to November. We have a new president. January, that new president takes over. What happens to the country? What happens to the United States? And that's about actually what kind of policies are able to get through. What, what can the new president do? What kind of Congress does the new president have to work with? And actually, for all of our conversation about Trump and, and how extreme we see Trump, how different will he actually be were he to be, you know, by some miracle to be made president or I mean, imagine a Bernie Sanders Trump ticket. Ticket, not ticket. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that really would be. Can't imagine that. that. I'm not sure that that's a dream or nightmare, but a, you know, fight for the for the presidency. It's, it's interesting. I just want to note that we haven't discussed foreign affairs at all. Mm. The president of the United States is also the leader of the free world, and we're, we're talking about, in the case of the Republicans at the moment, the strong possibility of a Trump, and if not Trump, then possibly a Cruz candidacy. Um, a cruise missile candidacy. We, we, we'll still assume that Hillary Clinton will will get through, but you know, the world is not going is not the events of the world no longer wait on what's happening in America. Syria will continue to be th this 
cesspit, <clears throat> sadly, for the, the people of Syria, spewing out all manner of instability northwards into Turkey and eastwards and southwards and every which way. The Chinese economy, again, numbers that can't always be trusted. Who knows what that president will see? And how does that work? Or what that president can deliver. So, yeah. I mean, one of the problems with the dysfunction in the United States is it makes it hard for the president to lead internationally, to act programmatically. It's not that the president can't do anything, but, um, but it's, it's hard, and increasingly what presidents are doing is they are bypassing the democratic process. So that what you get a lot of in the U.S. now, it didn't start on Ob on, under Obama, but it has gone up on <coughs> Obama's watch, is unilateral behavior. Republicans scream bloody murder, you know, but it, it didn't start with Obama, but it has continued. So whether it's the Iranian deal, largely a unilateral, I mean, that's a treat that, you know, that didn't require ratification. It's a, essentially like an executive agreement for, for the president. There's a lot of things like that, and Obama is using his last year to, on a lot of domestic legislation yeah. in particular to, to move in that direction. So there's a, actually there's some very big questions in terms of democratic accountability in the U.S., right, that flow from this dysfunction, but it also raises questions about the kind of message that the U.S. is sending internationally, whether it can be counted on. All right, I'm going to take a pause there and throw this open to... to our audience. Um, just raise your hand and, and we'll get a, a microphone to you, okay? So I see a lot of journalists here and I'd like to know to what extent the media is fanning the flames of Trump's success and is he like ISIS? Do we just need to ignore some of what he's doing and stop giving him the attention that he's... Okay, could you speak, I know you've got the mic, but you need to speak a little louder and just ask the so question again. So how is the media contributing to Trump's success essentially? We should let the media speak. How is Trump contributing to media success? <laughs> well, yes, I'm that that question. 23 yeah. million people watched the Republican debates. That's, um, that is a dream that cable TV news did not think was possible. Uh, he, he is, he's great TV for large segments of the population. So I think you have a wonderful symbiotic relationship there. He depends on uh, what they call you know, unearned media, um, which is basically free publicity because he's in all the news stories all the time. Sanders has a tiny fraction, I forget what the number is, but it's a ridiculously small fraction of the coverage that Trump is getting. And the other Republican candidates are largely locked out too. So there's a very complicated and kind of, uh, you know, uh, circle of, of mutual love and appreciation going on between the two. <coughs> I think I saw an Onion headline the other day saying Donald Trump woke up this morning. That's literally what it's like. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's incessant. And I think it's very difficult for uh, other voices to break through. And the thing is, is when other voices start to break through, so I think you had little spells uh, later in the year where, you know, so oh, some policies are being proposed. Let's discuss the value added tax or things like that. And then Trump would go say some ridiculous statement and it would just take all the air out of that flame. He does it, he does it once and, a week. And he's a master. He's a master of, of manipulating the media. In the back there. Yes, go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Sorry? Yes, yeah, we can. Sure. Uh, who can beat Hillary? In, oh, inside it, the Democratic Party <coughs> or in a general election? No, in the general election. So, so okay. if we have Trump versus Hillary, I'm assuming most people would guess that we'll end up with President Clinton. But if it's not Trump, who actually can realistically beat okay. her, assuming okay. Hillary becomes the Democratic Party? I'm, I'm taking that one. So. <laughs> uh, so I put my cards on the table. I had, on the Republican side, I thought the sleeper all along was Kasich. And that he, it would be difficult to get the nod to win the, Demo the Republican nomination. He would have to hold back as long as possible, let the other knock each other off. You will notice that he's surging in New Hampshire right now. He's number two in the polls in New Hampshire. And if it's Kasich against Clinton, he'll beat her. So, you know, so there, there are Republicans that could beat her. But I'm not sure that Trump is the Republican, but I'm, I think who the hell knows, you know, with him. L let me give a slightly different answer. I, I actually think it's Clinton's to lose, and I think she's doing a really, really good job of losing. <laughs> um, I mean, she's just an appalling candidate. And for anybody who kind of liked her eight years ago and said, 
that's okay. You know, she's done a lot since then. Secretary of State, you know, et cetera, et cetera. She, she's learned. She hasn't learned. I mean, she's learned nothing. She still goes into her comms team and says, I don't need to hear from you. I know everything I need to know. I've been doing this for the last 50 years. Um, she's just a bad candidate. So it is hers to lose. The question is, is actually, sorry to go back to statistics. Let's put aside Trump, because yes, I think she will, she will win against Trump. Um, I actually think that if it's her against Bush, she loses. They both got the same problems. Bush is also, by the way, a really bad candidate. But you know, I actually think he's probably less bad than she is. Um, and I think if it's her against Rubio, she might lose. And again, but she shouldn't lose against Rubio. But I suspect she might because she's a really bad candidate. She just doesn't know how to do it. But she's not, as an individual, a really bad candidate. She's just very bad at candidate. Candidating? How do you say that? Yeah, campaigning. Yeah, yeah. That's much yeah. better. Candidating. <laughs> Adam? Campaigning. I'm Adam. Um, just, just for uh, context, um, the electoral map that I'm looking at right here, that I think is is possibly a, a good viable mm. one. 270 electoral votes to win the presidency, as we all know. Uh, where the Republicans are right now, if they keep all their Republican seats from 2012, uh, they have got 206 uh, uh, electoral college votes. The Democrats, if they keep all their, their states from 2012, have got 247, which leaves you uh, seven swing states with a total of only 85 electoral college votes up for grabs. That means, according to this electoral map, uh, that means that if the Republicans lose Florida, uh, they've lost the election. If the Republicans lose Ohio plus one other state, they've lost the election. The Republicans have got to win pretty much all of the seven swing states in order to win the election. And that is a big ask. They've, they've got a mountain to climb with this, I think. I did the math. So <laughs> if it were Kasich and he picked Rubio. Ohio plus Florida, you could, you could just about do it. Right. It would be a squeaker. You, still, you need you some change, but, right, yeah. but if it was Bush plus Kasich, and we know that Bush can throw Florida any time he wants into his own column. <laughs> <laughs> right. He counts the votes. Um, I, uh, always, they just pull I, out their no, butterfly ballots. No, he really ballot. We <laughs> know that George I, I, W. Bush's I, I, brother didn't help him in 2000. I don't swing at low pitches. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I will say this. is I'm a terrible political prognosticator. Uh, I don't, never hire me to run a campaign. Uh, but I really think that anybody can beat Hillary Clinton. I think Bernie Sanders proves that. I don't think Bernie Sanders is a great candidate. I think Bernie Sanders is actually a really bad candidate. He mumbles. He sort of talks about class warfare a little bit. Goes in front of you. I mean, like literally, it's like the least well-produced campaign of the 21st <laughs> century. And it, Hillary Clinton, she just has a glass jaw. She really does. I mean, there's, there's so many problems. There's so many scandals. The last thing Americans want to do is go back to the 1990s and the drama of the Clintons and all of that baggage. And I think. Maybe with the exception I'm of Trump. Are, are, you sh are you sure you're not s seeing projecting. things through your own very narrow filter well, on that one? I want to support my Republican friend down yeah. in the end here because what polls show is that Republicans are convinced that they will beat Hillary Clinton, that any of their candidates can beat Clinton. And that means that they think that Donald Trump can can I can I add one one bit of empirical evidence to support my narrative? Oh, <laughs> we, we love empiricism. This is England. Name name a, a campaign that Hillary ran well and won. Name actually anything she's really done well and won. She's not really appreciated as Secretary of State. Benghazi uh, well, huge scandal. Well, no, no. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Oh, okay. Okay. Her poll well, weights coming out of being Secretary of State were exactly. 60 plus percent. Exactly. Well, what are they now? W William, William, yeah. you also uh, forget something, and, and we haven't brought it up about Hillary, but she is a woman. And there's a key issue mm -hmm. that virtually every woman, even those who are married, and perhaps go to an evangelical church on Sunday, 
in Tennessee think about, and that is the abortion issue in the Supreme Court. And for a lot of women, mm -hmm. that will swing everything. And for their husbands and their friends, and in, and in the coastal cities, and, and in the big states, and including Florida. So don't, I, I mean, I understand well, why, you, why you would be dismissive. Because it's easy to say that she's a terrible candidate, because yeah. she is a terrible candidate. But, this but is leaving that aside, that's a, a critical This is why it's hard to lose, because mm -hmm. she, she should get the vast majority of women, she should get the vast majority of black Americans, and there's sectors of America that she she just should win, she's unless a, she actually, you know, unless she actually, Which is actually won so badly that she loses those people swing, and they don't bother it, coming look, out. It swung North, Car it yeah, swung North Carolina. Uh, we're whispering now. Sorry, sorry. we're talking about uh, the, the importance of the African American vote. Is this in North Carolina? I, if you had told me of all the unbelievable political things I've ever seen, uh, that North Carolina would go for an African American president yeah. for. Mm. candidate for president I would never have believed you it's happened it can happen for Hillary Clinton as well on the strength of the african-american vote going to move on now there's one question there and then I'll come over to you okay so okay well um, would Elizabeth Warren have won the nomination if she had stood hmm. <laughs> she might she might win in a brokered convention yeah. it seems <laughs> unlikely I, you know, could be, uh, what Donald Trump today said he thought it was going to be Joe Biden before it was all over. That th in other words, it be, would be a brokered convention that Hillary wouldn't get enough delegates. I'm not sure I believe this, but, you know. And one other, one other answer, and then I'm going to take some more questions. Anybody else want to comment? Okay. Brokered conventions, we can come on to that again. Go ahead. I was just going to ask quickly, so we've obviously got quite a crowded field on the Republican side. Who's uh, Hillary's nominee for VP, do you think? Like beyond Sanders, what we've got O'Malley, who does she who does she take with her if she wins if she gets the Democratic ticket? Because I think from the reporting this side of the Atlantic, I couldn't tell you many names on the Democratic side at all, to be honest. Well, she she takes people who can help her yeah. in the swing states. So, yeah. presidential elections are won <coughs> in the swing states and at the centre. Right, that's that's really the, the the central fact of any presidential election. So, she has got to win Florida. She's got to win Ohio. Uh, 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 or Virginia. Or Virginia. She could do it Virginia. through, through Virginia. Virginia. Uh, so, so she'll be looking for somebody who can help her there. So for example, Florida, um, what's his name? Castro, the congressman. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Cuban-American, very Castro. personable guy. There's quite a deep bench, actually. There's quite a lot of people. Well, so if she needs, a lot of it depends on who the Republicans choose. If, if she calculates electorally, what she needs is Virginia to be able to sew it. I mean, this was the kind of standard calculation, which means she would go for one of the two white senators from Virginia. She'd probably go for Kane. Um, I think that's what the betting is, is that she's a young guy, you know, and that he would bring something to the ticket. But if it were Rubio or Cruz that she was facing, she'd almost certainly have to go demographic and not go uh, play the kind of electoral college. So she would go for a Hispanic on the ticket, and most people think she'd pick one of the Castro boys out of Texas. So one of the, you know, Castro's, uh, Castro, the mayor of San Antonio, and the brother who's uh, in the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, let's move along. Yes? I've been wondering, how do Americans vote? Do they vote based on um, policies, how charismatic the personalities involved, or <laughs> do they vote to make history? Let's vote for Obama to be the first African-American president. Let's vote for Hillary to be the first female president. Probably. On what basis do they vote? So that's, a very good, that's a very good question. Great question. If, you, if, you, if you look at, so, uh, if it were policy, if you look at the policy, there's new results just came out that, you know, shows that in December 2015, 18% of Americans um, polled uh, suggested that terrorism was the most important issue. I absolutely guarantee you in six months that will be twisted around and it will be back to economy, budget, jobs, etc., etc. So on policy, it's about economy. I mean, Carvel's it's the economy stupid still holds definitely but I actually think I don't know that policy has a huge influencing factor um, I mean I think it is partly policy yes that does matter some people vote based on their policy I mean it's probably not so different from the, the way people vote here some people vote based on the the charisma of the individual some people if it's Hillary they'll vote because she's a woman it's as simple as that 
Um, so it is, it's, it's not a black and white. I think it is, it is definitely a mixed, mixed issue. But in policy terms, unfortunately, it's never foreign policy. It's always economy. I mean, I think, I mean, for Sanders voters, I think, are probably looking quite seriously at policy. Um, he has a very specific policy platform that really appeals to working Americans. Um, very specific things. You know, fr free tuition and public universities, stuff like that. Um, over on the Republican side, I would suggest that what's going on over there is completely unrelated to policy, and it's largely performative. You know, this is about theatre, it's about sentiment, it's about anger, it's, it's about other things. Uh, so I think it kind of depends where, where, where you're looking at. I do think that there's a lot more consideration of policy over on the left at the moment than there is on the right. It's not always the case. But is that the, is at the moment. Do you agree with that, William? Uh, it's, it's hard to argue with that because I don't think Trump has put any policy forward and he's the front runner. <laughs> um, but that is Cruz, really. I mean, if you look at Cruz's website, it's very really hard to find a policy on that. Yeah, I, I, think, I think websites at this stage, until you get to the conventions and the policy details get ironed out, um, it's just difficult generally. I do think, I think, there's this, I think the portion of voters who are just generally motivated by policy is continually growing smaller. I think um, there's a couple of trends that speak to that. One is identity politics. I think another one is it's very hard to make a policy retweetable. Um, <laughs> it's very easy to make an ad hominem attack retweetable. Uh, and I, uh, maybe I betray my age here, but um, my Twitter feed is inundated with political messages. Uh, my Facebook feeds are inundated with political messages. And it's very hard to difficult, uh, discern any reasonable discussion about what a presidential candidate actually wants to do to make America better from that. Can, can I ask a question, that, just a quick question, though? I mean, when you grow up, so I grew up here. I didn't grow up in the United States. But when you grow up, I mean, what makes you a Democrat or a Republican in the first place? Is that your parents? or rebelling against your parents? Or is it because actually at some level you consider yourself to be liberal-minded and therefore you believe in gay marriage, you believe in et cetera, et cetera, or you're conserv fiscally conservative, et cetera, et cetera? Well, I'll, I, I, I'm, I I'm will answer that since you asked. Yeah. I can remember in 1956 queuing up outside a schoolhouse, Dalton School, on, yeah. on the Upper East Side of Manhattan with my parents. They were teaching me how to be a good citizen. Mm. My little brother was in a push chair, and my parents were voting Democrat in, a, in an election that Adlai Stevenson was going to lose in a landslide. But you get brought into it, kind of like you get brought into being an Arsenal supporter. And then, <laughs> and then you, you, yeah. you think uh, pr there's possibly a window in your early 20s when you're first out from under your parents' thumb and making your own way. You say, well, this is not quite the way it's supposed to be. And if you don't get if you don't get got there, um, you're pretty much going to be with the party you were introduced into. If your parents you know, talked about politics at the table, same with news media, by the way. You read the New York Times because that's what your father read and discussed with you. You read the Wall Street Journal, the Daily News, the New York Post, whatever. And, and, and that, I think, is, is really the way people get into it. And then there's that window or some extraordinary thing as happened in, 19, in the mid-1960s when Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act and a bunch of people who were New Deal Democrats but happened to be white Southerners said, well, this is no longer a white man's policy. party. And that is a, but those things happen very, very, very rarely, I think. But immigration could be a monumental shift like that. I mean, the first, the first party, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's odd. I mean, you have Republican candidates decrying amnesty left, right, and center. But it was really Reagan who did it. Who did it. Uh, so, it, 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 I think the next the next party that really can to make policies to fix the immigration issue will have a huge swing in that Maybe. demographic. I'm going, to, I'm going to call on that gentleman. He's been waiting a long time. Adam, you live in D.C. I live in Berkeley, so neither of us live in America. My question, hypothetical for everyone, let's suppose there's a severe recession this year mm -hmm. during the election. How does that shake it out? It doesn't, I mean, where I live, it looks horrific, but I'd like to know whatever any of you think. If it keeps on getting worse, the Dow's had its worst first two weeks since the 30s. The Democrats take it right in the neck. It almost doesn't matter under those conditions. Because, who they, the because they're the incumbents. Is. I mean, what people forget is Obama right now, like probably the single best predictor of what happens is the president's standing in the polls. I mean, it's not the only one. But really what you want if for a third term, for the Democrats to hold a third term, 
you know, Obama's number should be, his approval rating should be over 50. It's not. He's under 50. Not by a lot. He's like around 46, something like that. 46, 47. Much lower, by the way, on foreign policy, about 10 percent lower on foreign policy. But if you, so if the economy and the thing that really matters the most for that figure, you know, his approval rating is how people rate the economy. So if the economy were to take a major hit, right, then his approval rating is going to go down. People are going to blame it on the Democrats. I mean, blame it on Obama and she or whoever the Democratic candidate and we, we'll, we'll carry that baggage. I, I, I personally. Yeah. Okay. Anybody want to add on to that? I just would draw an, an analogy to. Ask McCain. Yeah. yeah. This is what I was <laughs> going to say, 2008. Yeah. I mean, that was a foreign policy election through and through. What are we going to do in Iraq? What are we going to do in Afghanistan? August, September hit, and the election became about something entirely different. Um, and Mitt Romney would have been the much better candidate for that election. Had that recession just happened four months earlier, you would have had a very different Republican nominee. Okay. Gentleman in the front. Yeah. Um, obviously, America doesn't have a, a tradition of having a third candidate, an independent candidate. Um, you guys were talking a few moments ago about you weren't necessarily talking about Trump as a Republican uh, front runner in a month's time, but is there a possibility of him being talked about in three months' time as an independent? perhaps spoiling uh, the Republican ticket in some of those key swing states? Absolutely. Adam, you're there. Yeah, absolutely. I would say yes. Uh, uh, he said that he would support the Republican candidate. Nobody believes him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, he said he would, and then he said he wouldn't. And yeah, then he, he said he would, and then he said he would. Uh, so, yes, absolutely, I think, I think there's a chance of that. And I was also wondering today, um, just to really throw it out there, what happens, just say, Trump-Sanders race, what happens if you get a centrist third party candidate? What if mm. Michael Bloomberg yeah. suddenly comes back yeah, to life? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, something. That, I, 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 I have that, to tell you, this is. This is I, I, I think there's all kinds of possible. I, 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 fo I follow oh, yeah. Peter Beinart on, on Facebook. Do people know who Peter Beinart is? He writes for the, he writes for the Atlantic. He writes for Haaretz, and and he's quite a well known columnist in America, and he po posted something about the election, and Roger Ailes, real for real says. Watch Michael Bloomberg. That was three hours ago, yeah. and Bloomberg I do wonder: should we be watching said, Michael Bloomberg? I mean, well, he said um, uh, repeatedly, privately in New York, that if he saw uh, an election where he considered both candidates too extreme, that he would run as a third-party candidate. He thought about it in 2008, thought about it, I think for a second in 2012. But he does say to people around him that he mm -hmm. would he would consider a, a self-financed run if he thought that polarization was uh, as a unifier. And apparently, um, yeah, yeah. He's, he's not short on self-esteem. And, uh, <laughs> and he has people doing the numbers for yeah. him and right he's now. Got, right, right. And he's got a massive financial information are, infrastructure. Are they at Bloomberg Terminals? Probably. Yeah, they're, they're. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I've got two questions here. I've got one down here, and then Ellen Stein in the back there. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, just to the people who want to know about how we become the voters we are. I grew up in New Hampshire. I now vote from Florida. Talk to me later. Um, <laughs> however, my question was very much along those lines because of Ross Perot. We might remember he had his own checkbook. He had the same characteristics of being bombastic as Trump. Do you have any view about how he actually got on the platform, he was an independent, and he got this much vote? So can we hope, <laughs> sorry, you know, now wow, I'm not voting uh, for Trump. Can we hope that that is the same phenomenon that's, that can happen? If you were to run as a third party candidate. Yes. Can I, can I, I, I think it's much more possible uh, because of the internet. I think my recollection from political science 103 or whatever it was way back in the day. 101, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, was uh, that Ross Perot's campaign uh, was had the, the attitude of the country right, but he just didn't have the organizational fact. I mean, he didn't have a party organization to help him get all the legwork done for that. I think the internet has transformed the way campaigns are run, and I think it's much more possible than it was 20 years and ago. He, and he didn't have, to be fair, he didn't have Trump's personality. I mean, so, <laughs> uh, for both good and bad. But I mean, it, you know, Trump's kind of a larger-than-life figure, and Ross Perot was not. And, and even though he wasn't, he got 19 percent of the vote, just enough to kill off the older Bush, you know, basically. And um, so Trump would probably pull, you know, you would imagine would pull at least that much. It would be a huge problem for the Republicans. He's not going to pull those votes from Democrats. 
Um, well, speaking of Michael Bloomberg and billionaires in general, um, I watched the debate last night, Democratic debate, and one thing that really struck me is that uh, Sanders is talking about structural change, specifically uh, repealing Citizens United and getting you know the the influence, the enormous the ability of of billionaires to fund candidacies and then the slide towards oligarchy. Um, but that's structural change and that takes a long time and is very difficult. And Hillary is, is more, you know, a sort of tinkering around the edges to make things a little better here and there. Um, because, but politics is the art of the possible, so maybe that's more realistic. But my question, but people I think are, are really responding to Sanders raising this issue of control of politics becoming, you know, a rich man's woman's hobby. So do you think, if he doesn't win, do you think that message will continue and that theme will continue to gain, gain traction uh, no matter who's elected? The answer is yes. I mean, the, the reality is, uh, and this is the trouble, you know, what, what works for a tweet is a very solid idea out there that's very easy to explain. Policy is anything but a solid idea out there. Policy that is practicable is even further away from it because it it's compromise. I mean, it has to be compromise. So, you know, ideas like Citizen United, you know, the idea that we would take big money out of American politics, that's not happening anytime soon. Um, I think there are an awful lot of people who think it would be a, an absolutely wonderful thing. But if you look at polls, you look at the way Congress is made up, that is not happening, and the way actually uh, the Supreme Court is made up, that's not happening anytime soon. And so, I mean, one of the things that, I mean, on the Republican, I'm going to leave aside the Republican side for a second, because actually I think I mean, one of the most fascinating things about looking at the debates, the Republican debates and the Democratic debates, the Democratic debates are all about policy. You know, I mean, when, when Sanders is given a nice softball to critique Clinton and President Clinton, he says, no, I'm just not interested in doing it. You know, whereas the Republican debates are nothing about policy at all. I mean, there's no policy in the debate at all. It's all about, it's all about personality and, and, and fighting about personality. So the reality is you're at two extremes. You're going to come together. You're going to see whoever is the Republican, whoever is the Democratic nominee, move to the middle. Even if it's Trump, you're probably going to find that person move to the middle. And then they're going to become the president of the United States. And then they're going to be able to do even less than they promised in the compromise it's, space. It's, I mean, it's, it's just almost inevitable that we'll, we'll continue to have a US House of Representatives that is held by Republicans. We'll probably still have a Senate that's held by Republicans. 75% exactly. of state houses right. around the country are held by Republicans. Structural change is yeah. not, it's just not, gonna not happen. happening anytime soon, with or without President Sanders. It's, it's, it's not, it's not but do you think there'll still be a There'll still be people talking about it, but there have been people talking about it for eight years now. But and, and I, I wonder, you know, there's this old thing in, in America, and it comes back to Bernie Sanders, is that you can identify inequality, and a lot of people, you know, and, and you can point out to, to many of, of, of Trump's supporters, well, he's a billionaire, he inherited his gig, and, and you're concerned about inequality and money in politics. But the solutions tend to be more leftish on that. And the minute you go that way, then people say you're a socialist. Mm -hmm. And, that, and there's, oh, there's been this inside American society since before I was born that the solutions for economic unfairness that accrues naturally, I think, in a capitalist system are seen as being socialist. And that's godless communism. You can't have it. And so you don't get a solution that becomes practicable. I'm, I'm just going to go to this young woman here. She's been waiting. I was just wondering what the panel's opinions were on Sarah Palin backing Trump and her own ability to polarize Republicans and Americans in general. Do we assume that everyone who loves Trump will also support Sarah Palin? It's allowed him to, to get access to the evangelical vote that he didn't really have in the same way before. So is it going to be useful to, pay, to Trump absolutely in Iowa? Because she does. She is supported very much by evangelicals. That is actually a group that he hadn't really tapped into previously. That will allow him to tap into that group. Whether it's actually going to help him much outside of Iowa or the Midwest is less clear. 
I knew that question was going to be asked. <laughs> so I did some research. And I went to see like what her poll numbers are in Iowa. It's amazing you can do this, right? So the last poll was in 2014 because you know she hasn't been that active, you know, politically. The numbers are staggering. 68% approval in Iowa. So you can see why Donald Trump was interested in her endorsement and why she might be interested in endorsing Donald Trump. I think I think her endorsement is less a positive for Trump. It's more devastating to Ted Cruz. Yeah. Um, yeah. She, if I had to pick a prototypical person to endorse Ted Cruz, I would pick Sarah Palin. Evangelical boxes, conservative boxes, sort of establishment, but also rebel. Uh, the fact that he didn't get that endorsement is, is I think, really bad news. And she did in 2012. Yeah, she, she endorsed, did. She endorsed him, him. Yeah. for Senate. The yeah. governor of and Iowa Rubio. has yes. come out today and said that uh, uh, called on Republicans not to uh, support Cruz mm. because of his opposition yeah. to ethanol, ethanol subsidies yeah. in yeah. Iowa. So Cruz has taken a double whammy in Iowa. Yeah. And while until today we have sort of felt like they were running neck and neck in Iowa, I think maybe this may be yeah. Cruz's yeah. sort of um, it's a very bad moment for him. Okay. Millicent, your choice. Sorry, I'm like in the middle of Okay, go Hi. ahead. Um, I'm interested, um, after years of um, Black Lives Matter movement and um, protests against police violence on African Americans, um, you haven't mentioned at all the sort of African American vote. Um, who do you think is, more, is most appealing to that community? Clinton. Hillary. Yeah. We, we, we do mention that. But she's not a lock with them. So one of the things that was really interesting about the South Carolina debate, what, so the debate the Democrats just had in South Carolina, it was like, it was last week, right? Sunday night. Sunday, was watching Hillary wrap herself in Barack and, Obama's yeah. cloak. Why? Because his approval ratings in South Carolina mm -hmm. are through the roof. Through the roof. And she knows she can't count. She can't, it's, she'll get African American support. She'll get Hispanic support. That's not the issue. The issue is what's the margin? How high, how intense is that support? Now, Obama will almost certainly campaign for her, but it's not quite, you know, and that will help a lot. But, I mean, they won't have, they're not going to be able to. The only alternative, if you had somebody like Kasich who doesn't, some, there are a couple Republicans that would not generate the same kind of maybe visceral reaction that a Cruz or a, um, the, a Trump would among African American voters. But I mean, they're going to vote Democratic. The only question is at what level? You, you raise a very interesting point. I mean, I think uh, one interesting feature of this upcoming election is this is the first presidential election of like an outgoing two-term uh, president where the president will actually be campaigning for someone. Uh, you didn't see Bill Clinton at all in the last four months of 2000. Who George Bush, at? who is yeah. George Bush, <laughs> right, in 2008? Like, who, George Bush who? Um, yeah. it, it, that's going to be a very interesting dynamic this year because you'll actually have a sitting president with all the power of the presidency yeah. and incumbency campaigning on behalf of a Democratic nominee. Go ahead. I like the analogies with uh, Ronald Reagan and when he said we're going to make America great again, I think the US could make itself great again, but now it's a different world. Um, whoever ends up uh, uh, being president, uh, what's America going to look like in eight years' time with you know, China, the Middle East? It doesn't have quite the same levers to pull that it used to. Uh, so in eight years' time, are Americans going to be even more angry? Uh, perhaps I ask. Yeah, I'm glad you asked the question, foreign affairs question of some sort because we've missed out on that. Um, I, I think there, there's, a, I mean, there's a lot of st stuff here. Uh, American oil imports have dropped 60%, right? 60% since 2009. That changes everything. It changes the whole geopolitical landscape of the Middle East and America's commitment and involvement to it. And the reason that I think, you know, or at least part of the reason that we see such inaction, or what we think is inaction, by the Obama administration in the Middle East is it's simply day by day not so much in America's strategic interest to go and own the Middle East again. America is turning its face away, both from the Middle East and, and from Northern Europe, too. And it's looking south to Latin America, and it's looking to the Pacific. We in Europe do not normally think of the Pacific as a sort of strategic 
place with its own set, discrete set of strategic issues associated with it. We don't, we don't, it doesn't compute for us. For America, it does. And Obama was a harbinger of this. He's a child of the Pacific. You know, uh, uh, all his people think about Latin America and the Pacific. His chief of staff, Dennis McDonough, is a Latin America guy. The US-China relationship uh, is incredibly closely managed. An enormous amount of effort is put into that. And people really, really care about it. And they see it as possibly the greatest strategic issue that, that Washington must now manage in the, in the long term. So the ground is shifting in, in terms of these things on a, on a long scale, I would argue. And um, you know, probably the election is not going to do justice to any of that. I don't, I mean, I think interests, the nation's interests don't change. I mean, they pretty much stay the same. So whether, you know, whether you've gone from Clinton to Bush to um, Obama, the interests have stayed the same. It's how we actually manage those interests that changes so dramatically is what we see. And, you know, so uh, President Bush talked about promoting democracy. President Obama talks about supporting democracy. They both care about democracy, how they go about doing that, and how much it is us trying to force something on you versus us supporting you in doing something. That's where the change takes place. What we've seen over the last few years, um, even pre-Obama, um, but I think it's specifically, particularly over Obama's term, is America kind of say, wait a sec, the nature of the challenges we're facing are becoming far more global. We are no longer a sufficient actor to do something. We're necessary, but we're no longer sufficient. We have to do more multilateral. We have to work with other people. We have to take care of what's going on at home. That's changing. There's an awful lot of white noise going on, Syria, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan. But that is changing the way America acts and America's role in the world. And that's gradually beginning to change. That's going to keep changing, whether we have a Republican or a Democratic um, president. So I mean, I think the idea that we've got a whole different vision just isn't an accurate one. Um, and that this is true even if, you, even if you get Trump taking over. So I mean, I think there is a gradual change. We don't like it, by the way, because we're kind of used to America. We, now I'm wearing my British hat, we're used to America kind of coming and using its resources when we need it to use its resources. Um, but I think, I think that is changing. And I think we have to recognize and we're going to have to respond to it. By the way, America's Asian allies get it, and they're responding to it in a way that European allies are not. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think what I would add <coughs> to that um, is in my perception is that the United States and the Americans are, are interested basically in lightening their load internationally, and that Obama got that, and that that's actually what Obama has done on his watch, is he's rebalanced international and domestic accounts. I mean, that'd be one way to think about it, investing more on the domestic side than on the international side. And I actually think that it almost doesn't matter which part. I wouldn't have said this eight years ago, but I think given what's happened inside the Republican Party, <laughs> that it won't matter which party is elected on this, that the U.S. is going to continue to try to lighten its load, which what that means, it translated down to the level of foreign policy, is it has to prioritize. And so I think the way that shakes out is Asia gets more attention than Europe does. Um, and I think that's significant. Um, and I think Europeans, UK, Europeans, and the continent, they need to think about that. The, the bandwidth is not what it once was politically inside the US. OK, I've got time for two more quick ones. Yes? My observation is um, from when I became an adult and started following American politics. So please, if I'm wrong, um, correct me. But is there a reason why failed um, presidential candidates don't try again? Because if you fail in 2004, you should try in 2008. Because in my country, they, they attempt at least three times. They never <laughs> stop. <laughs> somebody. So, so somebody, go to Wikipedia, look up the name Harold Stassen, S-T-A-S-S-E-N. <laughs> All answers can be found there. How many times did he, how many times did you run? You're a Republican. You should know. He, he, a lot. About five or six. But times. I'll, I'll give you I'll give you more recent examples. Mitt Romney ran two years in a row. Uh, John McCain ran not two years in a row, but two years spaced over a period of eight. Um, Ronald Reagan really three times. Yeah. So '68 he dabbled, but he ran hard '76 and got close, and he was denied at the convention. 
right? And that's now, if she's talking about failed presidential candidates, like in terms of not nom not being candidates for the nomination, in terms of actual party nominees for oh, okay. presidency, Sorry, then that, maybe that's true. Right. Okay. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I don't have a good answer. One last question. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, yeah, just to bring it back home, uh, a Republican president, uh, during the COP debates, there's been a lot of talk of boots on the ground fighting ISIS. What would a Republican president mean for the special relationship? So if you look at the, uh, uh, again, I actually don't think it makes terribly much difference whether you get a Republican or a Democrat. I mean, yes, in, in, in the nuance, absolutely. But one of the things that you've seen President Obama do is take a look at the UK and say, yes, we still have a special relationship. We still have this Anglo-Saxon Anglo common values, common interests, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, honestly, the UK is spending less on defense, is becoming less of a player in that space. The UK is suddenly introverted and, and, and thinking internally and, and trying to manage domestic internal um, uh, political battles. And the UK is thinking of leaving Europe. So actually, I'm going to start to talk to France, because France has a pretty capable military. And I'm going to start to talk to Germany a little bit more than I was, because Germany is where you go to if you want to talk about the economy, or if you want to talk about Russia, or actually, if you want to talk about energy, you go and talk to Germany. So actually, what you're seeing, in, and it's partly, I mean, it's very large part self-induced, is the American president, whoever they are, are increasingly looking at the UK and saying, yes, Britain is still our translator, it's still our closest ally in terms of values and how we think about things. But in practical terms, in terms of getting stuff done, I'm actually going to be building my relationships and diversifying my relationships but with I, I'd like, I'd like to, to just, just very, very briefly, of the last, um, uh, both under George W. Bush, I, I think, and under Obama, the relationship was fractured quite a lot. Uh, the Obama people really don't like the Brits. And the people around Obama don't like mm. the Brits. But a lot, a lot of that's for personal reasons. Uh, Obama doesn't like the Brits because of what they did in Kenya to his, to his family. Um, there's no sense of emotional kinship or, uh, with a, a lot of these people in, in the Obama administration. And a lot of professional relationships and military and intelligence were broken by the Iraq and Afghan war, where British over-promising and under-delivery <laughs> Uh, 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 spoiled a lot okay. of a the, lot of personal. See, things. we're coming to the end of the session, and that's when you get to the the <laughs> point <laughs> everybody wants to get in on. But what I, I, since we can't all get in on it, what I'd just like to shift along is because it's an interesting question. There's been um, an era of conservatism that was united at the hip, not special relationship nation to nation, but going back to Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, and through the think tank networks that exist in Washington mm -hmm. and here in London, where conservatives exchange views constantly mm -hmm. and go in and out of government as they do at think tanks. And I wonder what a Trump presidency mm -hmm. may not happen, folks, but it could happen. Is Trump a conservative? Is he a real conservative in, in the Margaret Thatcher vein? And what would that do to that side of things? Would it be the end of Anglo-Saxon conservatism as we've come to know it in the last 40 years? I don't think it would be the end of Anglo-Saxon conservatism. Um, because I don't think, well, first of all, let me start off with the initial question. I don't know if Trump is a conservative or not. I don't. Um, and I don't think there's anyone who can know that except for maybe Donald Trump himself. Um, that said, I don't think the real policy movement in the Republican Party is or has been at the presidential level for a number of years. I think it centers around Paul Ryan as Speaker of the House. And I think in that sense, and assuming that Paul Ryan uh, isn't loathed by half the party and chased out of Washington, D.C. at some point, um, so long as he maintains prominence, there will continue to be a strong exchange of conservative ideas between both the United Kingdom uh, and Washington, D.C. Um, and it's interesting to note that, you know, so we're actually, uh, this is a minor plug, but Republicans Overseas is running a straw poll right now. It's open to Brits, Americans, rostrawpoll.com. And it's interesting to see, I'm sort of privy to the background as the, the ballots come in, to see um, a number of, uh, of UK uh, citizens uh, supporting Trump, um, which is interesting um, from my perspective, because uh, I wouldn't have thought that before the poll. So I, I'm not so sure it ends the cooperation, um, but I think I think it just changes the center of gravity a little bit. All right. Well, we, we're coming to the end, so I'm, I just want to wrap this up. 
send it along the panel, but in this context. In this precise week, in 1968, Lyndon Johnson was the President of the United States, had gone through a period of extraordinary popularity, which was on the wane because of the Vietnam War, but was, by all intents and purposes, about to be reelected for a full second term. This exact week, last week of January, 10 days to the end of January, on, over the weekend of January 30th to February 1st, came the Tet Offensive. By the first week in March, he went on television, and, or the end of March, he went on television <coughs> and said, I will not be a candidate for my party's nomination. Four days later, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Ten weeks later, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. Everything changed. Anything that was being discussed at the end of January was off the books, off the table. And I wonder, as we look at the start of this year, markets truly trembling, there's no solution to whatever is happening in the Middle East. How many people, how many of the panel, just go along, think that what we're talking about today will hold up to the nominating conventions at the end of July, beginning of August? It William? Won't. No, it won't. <laughs> I, I will be surprised if we're still talking about Trump in a few weeks' time, in the way we are. I think the dynamics will change. Yeah. Events don't stop happening. You know, there's going to be something. There will be an attack. There will be, there will be, you know, the economy really will tank. The probability that we don't have some big event that takes place between now and the summer is almost inconceivable. I came of age during those moments. I remember those that convention. I'm not sure that Donald Trump is through, but those, those, that year, that half a year, that New Hampshire primary where Lyndon Johnson lost, but he actually didn't lose. He actually won the popular vote, but Eugene McCarthy got so close that it was considered a victory. I mean, those, those were really tumultuous times. I don't think that's where the United States is right now. You don't think Polar that's where the United States I, is I right think now. that the United States is deeply polarized. I think the wheels were coming off the bus at that moment, back in the late 1960s. Mm -hmm. So you, you wouldn't be unsurprised then if come July, August, it's still the same basic players and this, these dynamics we've been discussing tonight are just reaching their natural conclusion. Hillary Clinton will be the nominee in all probability, we, we can't say that, the Republicans. Well, let's, let's just say that, let's just say that it's, it's Trump and Cruz, just for the sake of argument, three weeks from now. The establishment in the Republican Party will line up behind Donald Trump. That's what will happen. They, See? They're beaming in. They know. <laughs> I'm not okay. predicting it. I'm just saying, you know, that, so anyway. Okay. Well, look. You guys have been terrific. You've been very attentive. I heard no coughs, and it's the end of January, so good on you. I want to thank my panel, and I know you want to thank them as well.